<clears throat> All right, so good evening, uh, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you're coming in from. Um, I appreciate you being here and I appreciate you um, joining in for this talk. Today, uh, my name is uh, Noor Dean, I'm the founder of the Dean's Office, and today we'll be discussing mastering identity and particularly why or how to stand out where others fit in. I believe if you are here, you must have a personal story or personal experience around either struggling to fit in or struggling to stand out. Either way, we struggle. My uh, purpose with this talk is to help clarify a little bit about why we struggle and how we can ease all of those um, struggles to make life a little bit more easier for all of us and uh, to make either uh, fitting in or standing out. I would rather you stand out than to fit in, quite frankly, but um, to make either fitting in or standing out um, easier. Uh, but before we do that, I would like to begin with a little bit of a disclaimer I believe it's, it's, it's absolutely very necessary to say these things in the very beginning, that this presentation is for the purpose, uh, is for educational or informational purposes only. This does not substitute for psychological uh, or any type of uh, uh, um, special help or special needs or mindset, uh, healthcare professional consultations. If you're having issues that are severe and you require um, psychological assistance, this is not, this, this should not be taken as, you know, I've seen a psychologist or I've spoken to one. I, I have no psychological qualifications or uh, healthcare professional qualifications whatsoever. Uh, and, we're only discussing this topic as a means of informing the public or educating the public on a particular topic or the depths of how uh, deep this uh, topic around identity goes. So that being said, I'd like to jump right into the content and what we would be discussing today. First of all, I'd like to uh, begin with a, a scope of identity and meaning. Uh, we, where we will be discussing just how far wide or broad um, identity covers, what is identity, what isn't identity, and uh, its relationship to meaning, how we derive meaning, either meaning of self or a meaning of group or a meaning of life in general. And then next we'll be moving into matters around identity, uh, which will be focusing, uh, focusing specifically on uh, matters concerning our time, because identity goes back all the way back to the beginning of mankind. And in, in one hour, I'm not sure we can cover all, all, all of that. So we will be discussing uh, matters around our time in effort to make sense of modern times. And then next we'll be talking about a framework for identity. The framework quite specifically is the one thing that is missing from a lot of studies around identity or a lot of the, the, the teachings and discussions around identity. And that is the one major thing that I would want you to take away. That's, that's the one major uh, point of this conversation. So stick around for that. I, I, I believe um, there will be a few things to learn from that. And then next would be the types of identity. This is important because we don't necessarily know uh, um, the types of identity that there are and which ones we have or which ones we, we, we lack. So this would help clarify. So uh, having said that, I'd like to start. Thank you very much for joining. I can see we have Peter and uh, uh, Bright in the house. Um, if you're in the chat section, would you uh, kindly just let us know where, you're, where you are joining in from um, so, so we get a sense of um, our attendance? Um, Rehanet, if you're in the, if you can uh, see the chats, could you maybe read out um, where they're joining in from? What, what cities? We have 
we have um I'm joining in from Ghana, Nigeria, actually. Okay. Yeah, we have Mr. Peter joining from Nigeria, and then we have Mr. Bright is joining in from Ghana. Oh, brilliant, brilliant. So we have a Nigerian and a Ghanaian. This is this is going to be a, I hope this does not end up as a, a, a an argument about whose jollof rice is better because uh, I mean, <laughs> I, I, I think uh, jollof rice has its own identity, but let's see, let's, let's see where this takes us. This, this, this is absolutely great. Um, so I, I, we'll begin with an overview on the scope of identity and the meaning. Uh, throughout time, Many people have dis defined identities in ways that suit their perspective or their preset uh, views of the world. One of the most uh, robust definitions of um, identity is what is on the screen right now, which is described as the qualities, beliefs, or personalities. Uh, looks and or expressions that make a person or group. In sociology, particularly, uh, identities are strongly associated with role behavior or the collection of group uh, membership that define the individual. Now this sounds a little bit complex, but essentially what they're saying is uh, identity is how you see yourself and how uh, you behave according to how you see yourself, your worldview or your personal view, hence the picture. It's your self-image. But more uh, interestingly, uh, a man named uh, Peter Burke defines identity as uh, something that tells us who we are and they announce to others uh, who we are. Um, identities subsequently guide our behavior, uh, leading fathers to behave like fathers and nurses to act like nurses. And if you come to think of it, it's actually quite true. Identity dictates who you are and how you are meant to behave. Now, this is interesting to me in particular for so many reasons. And that's, uh, and one of the reasons is because we live in times where you have all kinds of identities. You have your political identity, and therefore you have uh, identity politics. You have self-identity, and therefore you have gender identity and group identity and national identity and uh, digital identity and so many other types. And um, you also have lastly group identities, which are very specific. Uh, and, and uh, still complex. These, all of these identities are delicate and important because if we're not in control of either one of them or all of them or all the identities that we are affiliated with, then who is in control of them? And what role do we play in defining for ourselves who we are and how we are meant to show up and how does that affect our behavior? This is something that I set out to study about 13 years ago when I began my uh, education around identity and uh, research and uh, uh, experimentation and discovery and which led me to work with uh, multiple government organizations, uh, particularly here in Malaysia, uh, the Ministry of um, Tourism, the, the Ministry of Education, and several schools and colleges around here, because uh, what we came to discover was, or rather uncover, was that it's an, it, um, it's an ever growing field and everybody, uh, is getting it wrong. And I'll give you an example. Um, the Chartered Management Institute in the United Kingdom, Great Britain, is um, the world's leading institute for producing chartered managers. 
in every major industry. And under this institute, they teach five areas. They call them the five key areas for personal development. They talk about cerebral development, mental development. They talk about emotional development. They talk about physical development. Um, the, I believe the other two are spiritual and uh, something else. I can't remember the last one right now. However, in all these five aspects of development, nowhere did they mention the importance of identity. So it begs a question, if the world's leading organization for producing managers all around the world talks about five key elements of, of, of development, and they mention all these five, which are great, by the way, but they don't mention identity, which actually connects all of these things together, because all these, you know, mental, physical, emotional, spiritual, and every other thing is all connected to the person. But if the person doesn't know who they are, then how do you know, how do you develop yourself mentally and physically in a way that is in symmetry with who you are? Now, there's two reasons. It's either they expect you to already know who you are before you come into the management world, the leadership world, or they don't care who you are because they have an identity for you. I actually think it's the other one. I think they don't really care because if you really think about it, uh, in the corporate world, they go through all, we go through all kinds of training, corporate trainings and professional development, but there is never a corporate training on identity. Why is that? Well, it's quite simple. Your employer doesn't care who you are, doesn't care what your identity is. Your, your, your employer is predominantly concerned with who or what role they want you to play. Hence, you know, the corporate identity um, means that you actually have to show up as a professional in whatever field you are hired to be. It doesn't have anything to do with your life or your values and whatever else, which is a form of group identity actually. And that's what we hope to be discussing today. My definition for identity uh, is quite simple and is quite robust. And I would define it, or I like to define identity as a framework that guides our perspectives of the world and of ourselves and it governs our behavior. Because without that framework to guide our perspectives, we can't think for ourselves. We think according to our employer, our group, our culture, our family, our, our past experiences. And without the framework to govern our behavior, we would behave in very radical and sometimes very predictable ways such as you can find, particularly in Nigeria right now, you can find these type of things happening around the political atmosphere with, uh, with uh, what's, what's happening right now. Uh, I think uh, more recently there was the NSARS protest and, and you, you could clearly see a lot of uh, how identity politics played a role in dividing people into smaller groups just so that they can, uh, diffuse the situation. But this gives you a sense of, you know, why it's, it's, it's really important to be aware of what identities you are associated with and how that has an effect in your life. So before we do that, uh, let's look at the group and then we can zoom into the personal. Uh, so the next would be matters around identity and making sense of modern times. In group identities, it's uh, very common that we separate ourselves from others because as, as humans, we have a sense of belonging. We have a sense of wanting to belong to a group. We have a sense of, you know, fitting in to a, a way of life that others uh, just like us are like-minded and uh, like we all enjoy the same things, but 
essentially this this has a bit of a redlining effect it leaves other people out it creates a sense of us and them uh, situation uh, group identities have been uh, defined to be or to refer to a person's sense of belonging to a particular group at its core the concept describes social influence within a group now the key word that i want you to pay attention to is influence because that is all what the group identity does if you are not influenced into it or if you don't influence others you are not a part of the group or if you are not the product of the group influence you are not um, accepted into the group the, uh, there is a lot of heavy uh, um, influential uh, work going on with the uh, uh, group identities and and this 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 leads to a lot of the problems that we see today so let's get right into it uh, these include clearly uh, relating to the intergroup context such as stereotyping pretty sure we know once you have an us and them situation in groups it becomes very easy to stereotype the other groups it becomes very easy to say this is the way they behave this is the way they are this is this is how they show up. This is what they do, right? Uh, or in the other in the other in the other case, uh, we accept certain stereotypes about ourselves. We say this is who we are. This is what we do. This is what we like. This is how we uh, vibe or we relate. You see words like that used quite often. The next would be salience or collective behavior. We all have that, um, as well as others where an intergroup dimension has not always been acknowledged. Uh, uh, self or social influence leadership, ETC. Um, in this particular case is where you have uh, the same us and them dynamic, but we believe we are superior to them, or we believe that by some way, shape or form, they are superior to us. Right, so we don't accept their values or we believe that they are different. We believe that they are backwards. We believe that they are uncivilized, you know, uneducated, one, one, uh, one stereotype or the other. Um, what this creates in today's world um, is what we're going to be looking into next. The effects of this us and them type situation in the, in the world or the real world effects is something uh, that is well known to be uh, uh, redlining. I think this happened in the United States of America. And I, I, it, I'm quite frankly, it's still happening. Wherein, as you can see in the map, uh, certain areas of the country was uh, divided up and uh, restricted from having uh, financial services or any kind of economic or social uh, development uh, because they believe that certain uh, uh, people who lived in those areas uh, were either dangerous or these were hazardous areas. As you can see, it says here in the United States of America, redlining is this discriminatory practice which services uh, financial and otherwise were withheld from potential customers who reside in neighboring uh, uh, neighborhoods classified as hazardous to invest to investment. These residents largely belong to racial and ethnic minorities. Now, the racial and ethnic minorities are the group identities that we talked about earlier. These are people that identify themselves based on ethnicity or race and based on these two identities the people who were responsible for the redlining do not fall into these two groups so they believe by some metric of measurement that they were better than these races or ethnicities so therefore since you identify yourself as a particular race or group or ethnicity you live all together in one area but the effect of that is that others who identify as better than your race, they stereotype you, they then live in another area, but then they block you off and they say, you know, 
your area is like it's dangerous and you know it's hazardous it's not a good place to invest in it's it's, it's a very backwards place redlining by the way still happens uh, today in today's world i believe uh, it's even gotten worse it's called gentrification and many other things on a global scale redlining looks like the rapid development of uh, the middle east the united states of america the, the great britain uh, china and many other countries but zero development in africa it's 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 it's, it's a sort of a, a intercontinental uh, redlining if you will wherein all countries say africa is backwards we don't need development there because they're going to be using up their resources so let's keep it the way it is we'll pay their leaders to sustain it as it is and then we can just take their resources for our development no harm done it's 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 uh, it, it, um, it's an exchange but all all of what this does or all of what this hap um, creates is that because we identify as a certain group different from them uh, they find it easy to treat us differently. Now, the problems around uh, group identities are not always external, meaning they don't always come from other people trying to treat us as less than. Sometimes we internally find these problems in our own lives. And that's what we'll be discussing next. So some of the problems that we find when trying to be associated with some uh, groups would be first fitting in. If you are someone, uh, if you're in your early, early 30s or maybe even late 20s, you should find that the world has changed quite a bit from the way groups were to the way they are today. In today's world, groups seem to be more violent, seem, seem to be, particularly on social media, everybody seems to hate everything that is not, you know, theirs. Everybody seems to leave a nasty comment, right? Nobody has anything nice to say anymore. Whereas in the past, way, uh, way back in the 90s, I remember when we were forming groups, we were forming groups around activities we enjoyed and we were quite positive. So uh, things I believe in the past were a lot more positive than they are now. People were more willing to accept people into their groups. However, in, 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 in recent times, I don't see this happening. I see it more as you just are if you are, and if you are not, uh, we don't want you, sort of a situation. So a lot of people find it very difficult to fit into groups because the terms and conditions are really just, uh, you know, uh, very difficult to, to meet up to. The, the, the next thing that, uh, that leads to is a person losing their sense of self or losing their values and their foundation because for you to fit into any one of these groups or identities or any any group identity whatsoever you would have to leave behind a lot of the group um, a lot of yourself who you truly are a lot of your values the, the values and the principles that govern your life and the, the things that you were raised to believe were true and a lot of your foundation in life in general, you would have to leave all of that behind in order to fit into a particular group or to be accepted because they have their particular ways of thinking and you will be heavily uh, bashed for thinking differently, right? So you'd have to leave all of these things out. This causes a sense of emptiness in a person when they find that, yes, I'm a part of the group, but I don't feel complete here. The next thing that that leads to is groupthink. This is the word from George Orwell's book. I believe the name, I believe the title of the book is 1988 or 1986 or something like that. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's basically an extract from the Orwellian dystopia where he talks about groups or uh, communities that share the same ideology um, um share the same ideologies without question they don't question their ideologies they, they just take it as it is and they all agree uh, uh, with whatever you know that group de um, determines to be the truth or false on any given situation 
So there is no independent thought. There is no critical thought. There is no you know, difference. You dare not challenge the status quo, so to speak. Uh, what that also leads to would be mediocrity, because once you can't challenge the status quo, you set a standard for being. And when everybody follows that standard, everybody becomes mediocre. If everybody can play tennis to the, to the level of um, the world's best tennis player, by some degree, everybody becomes mediocre because we can all do the same thing, right? That's the standard. If you can't do it, you don't belong to the group. But if you can do it, then you belong. But also you become mediocre, right? It's a bit of a double-edged sword. This leads to familiarity because as we all know, groups tend to stick around for a very long time. They don't change very fast and their mediocrity does not change very fast either. So when they have set their standards for, from years ago or decades ago, in some cases, uh, centuries ago, that stand, those standards remain and they're very difficult to, uh, to change. So over time, you, be, you, you, you develop a sense of familiarity with the group. You develop a sense of, I know what's going to happen. I know what to expect. There's nothing new with this group. We've seen it all, we've done it all, you know, there's not going to be any new development here, right? Um, so people who are innovative and uh, uh, who, who think ahead or who think for themselves, who think differently, they usually suffer with the familiarity because uh, and the mediocrity. The next would be consistency, uh, hypocrisy, in particular, uh, multi-group identities. Now, this is uh, where a lot of people begin to seek help. This is where I find a lot of my, my clients having uh, struggles. And it is so because as an individual, we all have multiple interests in the different areas of our lives, which means we all have different groups that we are at some point in time interested in or affiliated with. And these two groups don't touch. These two groups, they, um, they are not uh, reconcilable. They're very different. But we have something in common with both of them. This creates a sense of hypocrisy because if you are to join any group, you are to follow the, the values of that particular group. So now sometimes the values of one group does not associate or affiliate with the values of the other. A very good example in the Nigerian situation, I'm not sure, I think I, I, think I noticed a few people joining in who may be Nigerian, but a, few, a very good example of recent events in uh, Nigeria was where you had the Biafra conversation come back again, but you also had the One Nigeria conversation come back again. And you found a lot of people say, you know, I am Igbo, but I believe in one Nigeria. And the other Igbos would say, how dare you? You can't say that. If you're Igbo, you cannot believe. You have to believe in the Biafra, right? So that was a very good example of not, not being able to belong to two groups because there's a sense of hypocrisy. Each group has its own set of values. And once you try to be a party to both, you, you are a party to none. I believe it was Plato who said, a friend to all is a friend to none. Essentially, he was describing a hypocrite. It uh, doesn't necessarily mean that you are hypocritical by intention, but the groups make you behave in a hypocritical manner, wherein you can't necessarily uh, transfer your values from one group to the next. Each time you are with one group of people, you have to act a different way, speak a different way, have a different mindset, have a different set of values. And when you are with the other group, you have, you have to do the same thing. You have to act different, speak different, maybe even bash the previous group, right? So these things happen uh, quite a lot. The last thing is fear, doubt, and uncertainty. With group identities, uh, it's, it's, it's quite interesting because no one person controls the group. No one person sets the standards and no one person can change them. And we all fear actually trying to change them or trying to rise above, you know, the set standards. Once they've set a standard and you try to rise above it, the group will tear you down. They will always bring you back, right back into, into uh, the framework that defines them. They don't want you to be different. They don't want you to stretch out. 
um, this causes fear of doing anything, anything differently at all. So you, you, you try to comply and you try to stay within the boundaries of that group. The second would be doubt because there is no clarity except for what has been predetermined by the group. But there is no clarity as to the new events that, that arise in life. There is no clarity as to where, what direction the group is headed because there, there is no clear leader. And with that comes uncertainty. You don't know what the future holds. If things were to change in a certain way, you can't predict it because again, there, is, there are no leaders. So there is no predictability. The result of all of this causes a person to be very torn apart, very lost, very um, uh, uh, internally divided. You, you, you don't know who you are. You're struggling to find yourself. You're struggling to be yourself, but you feel like you, everywhere you go, you're an outcast. You are, you are different. People don't understand you. And you essentially end up burying your true self and your true values deep within yourself, so far deep that sometimes you quite literally just, you know, uh, pretend they don't exist. And by doing so, you, you suffocate. You, you begin to find life to be very difficult to live because um, it, it, you're just not living a full life. You're struggling to fit into all these groups and struggling to reconcile. So let's uh, look at some of the solutions to this um, situation. For the problem of fitting in, the essence of identity itself is meant to help an individual stand out. You are not essentially meant, your identity is not meant to help you fit into any group. The, the point of having an identity is to make you uh, uh, able to be, you know, picked out of any of a crowd. If, if say there were a crowd of 100,000 people with the same name, they look exactly like you, they wore the same clothes, they walked like you, how can we pick you specifically out of that crowd? That's what an identity does. It, it specifies you in any given situation. So and having an identity and trying to fit in don't quite go together. In fact, it's quite the opposite thing. Fitting in would always require you to lose your identity, which is why the solution to trying to fit in would be essentially to stand out. It is a very difficult thing to do and a very hard thing to hear for some people because when they imagine some groups that they belong to, how do you stand out of those groups? Well, I hope by the end of this uh, talk, you will understand exactly how and why it's more important than fitting in. The next would be uh, in losing oneself and your values and foundation, in standing out, what you find is that since you are standing out, you begin to realize that you are standing alone. There's no one else with you. You're on your own. You are more like an outcast, driven out. And what that makes you do is that you develop your own foundation. You develop your own personal values, your personal view of life, your personal principles, and you become entrenched in these principles. You are very, very well dug deep down and buried and no one uh, can essentially just come around and you know, force you to change your mind, basically. So while other people are losing their values because they are joining groups, you are actually creating values, building values, and most importantly, you are building a foundation, a foundation to which many other people might actually find very interesting. And then that, those foundations that you build for yourself as a personal individual, may become the new foundations of a new group in the future sometime. So essentially you standing out begins to add value to other people who are like you, who have been struggling to fit into groups by creating your own sense of uh, personal values. And it makes life more understandable because you no longer fear being misunderstood. You no longer fear being accepted you are quite comfortable with being uh, misunderstood and rejected because you know, 
you've been you've been alone and you essentially don't really need the group to survive the lack and the next thing is while others are group thinking you would be a fully individuated uh, critical thinker this means that in your thoughts and your processes you are able to analyze a situation and think for yourself uh, in a way that is completely different from uh, the outcome that the group would have so while the group reacts emotionally uh, as you know this us and them type situation where you know they are our enemy uh, whatever comes from them is bad you would be able to critically analyze what what whatever the other person is and say well it really doesn't matter i don't like I, I don't affiliate with this group so therefore i can think to myself and say that what you're actually doing or what you're bringing is is not a threat to me in fact it's uh, uh, uh it's quite welcomed this critical thinking skill is a very important skill in today's world and and, and in the future quite frankly because um i believe the world economic forum listed this particular uh, skill uh, uh, individuation and critical thinking as one of the most uh, required skills for the next generation for the next decade actually in the corporate world so if so meaning essentially that a company or moving forward companies would hire people who are individuated and are capable of true critical thinking over anybody who has group think so if you are the sort of person who is uh who dresses a certain way um who speaks a certain way you carry yourself a certain way and it's completely different from the norm it's completely different from you know the regular people the company hires and you are able to demonstrate this difference uh, uh articulated properly a company is more willing to hire you because you seem to have a sense of self a sense of purpose whereas in the past it wasn't the case they they wanted people who were group thinkers to actually just join in because they were looking for like mass employment and factory workers type situation but now the world being different everybody group thinks um so they're looking for people who are different and the evidence of this is that in the past i believe people used to migrate more humanity would migrate outward into smaller colonies and distant lands uh, whereas now you find that there are more and more people coming into larger cities you have cities now that are about 30 million in in one particular city i believe lagos in nigeria alone is about uh, 28 million or so followed maybe even 30 million uh, followed by kano i believe in the north which is about uh, 25 if i'm not mistaken million people in one place so this gives you an idea of how large cities can be because everybody seems to be coming in and and you know wanting to be off the group i want to be a new yorker i want to be a lagosian right nobody wants to be just myself living you know on my own living like living my best life doing doing whatever i'm doing somewhere else because you know we fear being alone uh, rather than uh, uh, actually enjoying being alone and the next would be while others are being mediocre you would be uh, extraordinary because when you set your own boundaries when you set your own standards they are going to be very different from whatever the group standards are so by definition if you are constantly improving yourself constantly working on yourself constantly growing you constantly set these new boundaries whereas the group like we said stays fixed it doesn't grow it doesn't change very fast it stays fixed for a long for long periods of time for decades uh, um even whereas you would, could come up from the bottom and actually come to surpass the standards of the group so whatever you would do after a while would be seen as extraordinary compared to if you had identified with the group and remained under that group so your growth and your approach to everything in life would be quite extraordinary whereas most people who affiliated with the group would be um, quite mediocre uh with while everybody is suffering from familiarity with the group you, you would have the innovative difference the one good example here that i can think of would be um the dell hp microsoft um 
technological era and then Apple came out of nowhere. And I think Apple's exact slogan at the time was think different. And I believe it still is to some to a degree. But what happened was that in the beginning, they were very odd. They were very extraordinary, yes, but they were very, very odd. In fact, most people made fun of them because they were very different. But what has happened over time is that, you know, HP is basically, you know, packed up. Dell is closed down. Microsoft is struggling. And Apple has now become the main company that exists because of their innovative difference. People now enjoy being a part of that particular innovative difference. Nobody wants anything familiar anymore. Everybody wants things that are different. And because Apple has been different from the beginning, they have been able to stand out in this particular way, which is why you see standing out is, is, is usually different from fitting in. Had Apple become a company that fit in, maybe some company in China would have stood out and by now rule the world in, the, uh, in technological advancement. So while others struggle with being consistent, uh, consistent to the different groups that they are associated with, you, on the other hand, only need to be authentic. Because while you're being authentic, there is no such thing as being consistent. You, are, you can only be authentic in being yourself. Consistency is for something that is out of the ordinary, something that is out of your level of um, um, comfort, where you have to put some effort into, into doing it. Therefore, uh, you have to be consistent. It requires effort. Authenticity, however, does not require any effort. You simply wake up in the morning and you are yourself. Your values are the same as yesterday. You don't have to put in any effort to uh, be consistently authentic. You, you just be authentic and that's it. That's really what is required. And lastly, uh, with fear and doubt in uh, those who group think, you would actually inspire fear because people are quite afraid of people who stand alone, people who don't need other people, people who don't uh, need groups, people who think for themselves, people who are innovative, people who are extraordinary. They, they're very quite fearful. They say that a dangerous person is a person who, who thinks, right? So you would inspire fear where others feel fear to stand out. Um, where others feel uncertainty, you would have clarity because your values, your principles, your foundations are all your own. No one defines for you who to be or how to be or how to show up in the world. You define that for yourself. And that gives you courage even though you feel the fear, you have the courage to take, to take whatever actions necessary and you show up as a person who ultimately is brave. Um, so uh, before we move forward into the framework, I just wanna make sure we are uh, understanding each other here. Um, I wanna check in with the participants to see again who is tuning in because I, I believe a few participants have tuned in so far. Um, I can see Kabir, Samuel, and uh, I think Peter's coming back. Uh, a few other people in here as well. So uh, could you just let us know what, what cities you're tuning in from? And if you are, if you have been with us from the beginning, can we, can I get like, uh, can I get a text response saying I've been here from the beginning? Um, Rahanet, if you're there, you could probably read out what cities they're, they're, they're tuning in from, so, so, we have a, so we have an idea of um, the audience in here today. Yeah, so I think the response are just coming in. Um, if you could just kindly chat, um, send a chat. Yeah, some people, we have some more Guineans joining in. We have some more Nigerians. Um, thank you. For now, we have just mainly Kenyans and Nigerians. We're yet to see someone from a different country. Um, yeah, so I think that's that's about it. We have Kenyans, Nigerians, and we have um, some people that have been here from the beginning, and then some are just joining in. Awesome, awesome, great. So I believe if you've been here from the beginning, you must have already, uh, you, you must now see perhaps how um, 
standing out is always usually better in the long run than fitting in. And I think if you are uh, developing or growing or working on yourself or having any sense of personal development, you always want to think ahead. You want to think about what would this mean to me in the long run, not now. Now it may make sense to fit in because um, there might be some value, some immediate value in that uh, right now. But however, um, I think the, the, uh, the best of value would be that if you're able to think ahead and plan ahead, um, that would prepare you for the future. Uh, and uh, just by being authentic, uh, in in a, um, I mean a consistent way, you would you would eventually um, come out on top. Now, knowing that standing out is infinitely better than fitting in, the question it it, um, it begs a question as to how does a person practically apply all of this in real life. How do I actually do this? How do I actually stand out? How do I be different? How do I define myself? How do I break away from these group identities in a way that truly works, not in, the, in any of these uh, motivational speaker type ways and you know, like believing yourself and you can do it. Yeah, exactly. Right, so how do you really do it? What is the framework? And this, in, in, my, in my years of work, has been the one missing uh, piece of the puzzle that everyone seems to either get wrong or does not even seem to mention at all. And I, I, I believe the reason is because um, most people who, dis who discuss identity either discuss it from the branding perspective, whereas you're a, corp you, um, you're a corporation or an individual uh, service provider of some sort, and you are trying to brand yourself in a way that you can show up for your clients. So it's either you, um, you're from the branding uh, industry or you're from the psychological industry, psychology industry, where they discuss self-image psychology or self and, self and identity, uh, personality and stuff like that. Or, or you're from the uh, political industry where you discuss identity politics and, and, and things like that. Uh, or, or lastly, you are from the, uh, more, more recently, you are from the, um, uh, social equality or social movement um, industry where you're discussing uh, gender identities and uh, personal identities and uh, social identities and things like that. As, as, as we know today, um, there's, there is a lot, there's a lot of uh, talk around these, these particular subjects like uh, such as uh, gender identity. Every, it seems as though some, some way, somehow, men now want to be women and women now want to be men and you know people are beginning to have this topic around identity the last aspect um of this uh of the last group however which is actually the most forward uh, group um, that discusses identity is actually the uh digital technology industry and uh, they are the most um forward because big data has become a huge thing. With big data becoming a huge thing, corporations now need um, data analysts to, you know, to group people based on behavior so that they can sell better or they can communicate uh, better. This has a huge, huge, huge implication on an individual's identity because essentially the companies you buy from or the service providers are trying to understand who you are at your core and then group you into um, your likes, dislikes, and, every, and well, demographics, basically, so that they can um, sell that data to other corporations that you know, could then use it for whatever um, you know, uh, benefits that they, that they would like. The implication of this is that you are being put in a bubble and all of your information is being extracted from you. So in the, in, in, in the digital uh, world, 
uh, they've actually come as far as coming up with the term sovereign identity, which essentially means a person having full control of their identity, which is something that I have been discussing in many debates and uh, many talks um, um, over the years in self-identity in real life, people need to be sovereign in real life. Whereas in the digital world, they are actually bringing that into real life by using blockchain technology and, and, and many other things. So it's a very interesting dynamic to see how a person has a sovereign digital identity, but in reality, they don't. I'm really, really interested in, in looking at how the future would um, reconcile these two um, differences, because I believe we, we would have to catch up uh, and bring both things together. But onto the how, how to actually define your framework, how to actually begin to do the work around your identity so that you can stand out and not fit in. I've come up with a very simple framework to help you understand um, the types of identity that, that, that exist and um, how you can begin to um, understand all the identities that you are affiliated with and um, uh, categorize them properly so that you can begin to make sense of things. So we'll begin with the first one, which is the false identity or fabricated identity. These are identities that are not according to truth or fact. They're generally incorrect, uh, essentially. Uh, they're made to imitate someone or to deceive, they're illusory or they're not actually, not actually as they say. Uh, one good example is that I, I, I met a lady who uh, when, I, when I gave a seminar, um, uh, a lady came up to me and she said, this is, this is a very interesting topic. Thank you very much for teaching this. But then she said she identifies herself very differently and she wanted to know what I thought about that. And I asked her, well, what do you, how do you identify yourself? And she said, I, ident I, I, I am the universe and the universe is me. So this was something very strange to me at the time. This was in 2018. It was a very strange thing. I'd never, never come across somebody who was the universe before. So I actually had to stop and think. And eventually, uh, a long story short, I, I came to the realization that this was essentially just a metaphor that she used to give herself meaning. But in fact, she was not the universe. So it's not actually so. It's just a fabricated identity that we believe gives us a sense of purpose or meaning. But... You, you, like we're truly not the universe. We don't know what we are or we cannot articulate it properly. So we just say something that fills in the gap. It's like a placeholder, if you will. The next would be uh, transitory or contemporary and conditional identities. Now, this is where a lot of people, uh, this is where a lot of us seem to, seem to get lost. And this is where the group identities come in as well. Uh, transitory or conditional identities, uh, 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 sorry, con um, contemporary identities are essentially identities that are in constant change. They are constantly evolving. For example, um, you are a boy, you evolve and you become a man. You have no control over this evolution. You are not a man when you're born. You're born as a baby and you evolve to become a man. You die as a man if, um, if you live long enough. Another example is that you begin life as a student and you evolve to become a teacher, a professor, a professional, or a graduate, at least, of that student process. You are not in control of the time, the, the time span that is necessary to, to complete that transition. You can only go along with the transition, um, the process, until you come out at the other end. So these are transitory identities. They are things that are constantly evolving and constantly changing. So over time, they expire or they change, they transform. Conditional identities, however, are identities that only apply to you if you fit the conditions that are necessary uh, for those identities. For example, a, your national identity. 
is a is a good example of a conditional identity wherein the condition is that if you are born in that country if you're born in that land or you or, or you or your parents or you have either parent born born from that land you, you are you, you um, you belong to that nation so this is a good example of a conditional identity another conditional identity is if you are uh, employed by a particular corporation or industry or if you have the qualifications for a particular um, service, um, then you can claim to be, say, for example, a doctor, a lawyer. You have to fulfill the conditions in order, um, to, to be um, such a professional in order to claim that title. Otherwise, it will be a false identity. Claiming to be a doctor or a lawyer without the conditions would be false, right? Um, and this is where a lot of group identities come out of, which is why I said corporate identities are usually essentially group identities because they have these conditions. Just as social group identities as well, for you to become a member of our group, you have to look a certain way, dress a certain way, talk a certain way, act a certain way, have a certain mindset, then um, uh, we will accept you. Uh, and these are the conditions and the conditions don't change. We don't make, the, we don't make up the conditions and um, they just are the way they are, which is why you find out a lot of people losing themselves in order to fit into those conditions, to accept those conditions. The last of uh, the types of identities would be the original identity. The identity uh, that is original is one that is existing or pre-existing from the very beginning. The earliest identity that an individual has uh, there is only one example of this type of identity, quite frankly, or uh, I can give a few, but um, there is only one true example and, and I'll give you the reason why. The reason why, quite simply, is because of the nature of identities themselves. Identities are originally uh, derived from the point of origin of a particular thing or person. Your personal point of origin as an individual is where you get your identity from. I'll give you an example. The point of origin of an animal, maybe a cow, is it that it originated from the first ever cow that existed. And therefore the chain of cows continue. All cows will behave like cows. You will never find a cow behaving like a dog, for example. So the identity of a cow comes from the origin of the very first cow. The very first cow behaved that way, therefore all cows will behave just like that. The very first dog behaved that way, therefore all dogs behave the same. So you don't find that cross between you know, two different forms. All things follow their own track. Likewise, in humanity, or rather, not so uh, familiar in humanity. Uh, I believe it was uh, Friedrich Nietzsche or someone who said, or, or uh, someone else, one of, one of the greatest thinkers who said, mankind is the only being that refuses to be what he is. It's only mankind that, that chooses to deviate from his true identity, which is to be a human being. And original identities are identities that we get from our point of origin. And to find your point of origin is to find your point of creation. Where were you created? What, what created the first human? And whatever identity he had is the same thing that we have. So all the group identities and the transitory identities, these things are things that happened as a result of human evolution. But your original identity is, is, is always been there and it will continue to be. It, it's something that will not uh, change. Um, and the reason, uh, particularly for this, like I said, I would explain earlier quite, fr uh, quite uh, simply is if an inventor, for example, invents a pencil, if I'm the inventor of this um, object, I get to choose the identity of this object. I get to choose its name, its purpose, what function will this object have? Because I invented it, I created it from nothing. There was no sample that I copied. This was my own innovation. 
right? So I get to define what the identity is. It's not up to the pencil to decide for itself what it wants to be. No matter how free it is, I have, def I have, de I have created it as a pencil. So it will forever be a pencil, right? It can never be anything else. It cannot be a spoon. It cannot be a hammer. It cannot be a shovel. It's always going to be a pencil. It's always going to remain that way. Now, the reason why that condition is, is that the day it fails to be a pencil and it becomes a piece of wood, it has failed in its identity. It has failed in its purpose. Therefore, it's useless. I now need to go and create another pencil. And that's why identities remain from the point of origin because everything that is created is created with a purpose. So if things change that identity, then the whole world will not be stable. Everything will be changing, right? So for us to have a sense of constants, identities need to remain the same. Whereas humanity has a problem with that, like Frederick Nietzsche says. So that was, that, that was the point he was trying to make. So therefore, if the creator is the one that has the power to define what something is uh, and not the thing itself, then the origin of mankind or man humanity's original identity would only be found at our point of origin, which is our point of creation, which is, of course, uh, uh, God, which is why you can find among the greatest thinkers Topics like identity, self, and creation have always been thought of by some of the world's greatest thinkers. Uh, uh, Plato, uh, Da Vinci, and so forth. So this framework, essentially, that I've uh, laid out here is quite simply the framework that is required to help you filter out every group, every corporate identity, every community, club, ethnicity, everything that you use to identify yourself and put them into one of these categories. Doing this exercise helps you have a clearer sense of the world and it helps you have or build um, a clearer, found, a, a more stronger foundation for your personal development if you're moving on um, in life in general. Uh, the last and most important thing that I want to mention um, before I, I move on would be the idea of labels. And labels are quite dangerous because labels are the only thing that we use to undermine our original identity. Our labels can be things like our names, uh, which is a word or phrase. I don't believe I have to define a name. I think everybody knows what a name is, right? So our labels can be things like our names, our titles, and our epithets. The reason why uh, labels are used or are the most very slippery uh, when it comes to identities is that we answer more to our labels than we do to our identity, right? I may know that I'm a human being created by God, for example, but I answer more to my name or my nickname or my title or my epithet. Epithets are basically your characteristics, like... If I, if I give you an example, uh, if I say, and, and, I, and, I would like, and I would like for anyone in, um, in participation to, to join me in this practice. If I say a word, I want you to write down what uh, qualities or characteristics come to your mind. And I would like uh, Rehanet to perhaps read some of the things that are coming up because I can't quite, for some reason, see my chat screen here, except if I would um, try to do something like this. Okay, maybe this, okay, yeah, this, this works. All right, so if I said, uh, If I said a word, I would like you to read, um, to tell me what comes to mind. 
the first word is um, oh wait hold on the first word is a Japanese samurai if you're if, if uh, a Japanese samurai what qualities or characteristics come to mind when I say a Japanese samurai you can just type them in the comment section this is this is a general um, exercise a swordsman very good a swordsman uh, what else bright bright says a swordsman that that's that's actually quite quite interesting what else are there any and are, are there any qualities or characteristics that comes swords a defender a fighter very good i like this i like this let's keep it going who else is in there Okay, so a defender, a fighter. Very good. So let's take something else. Another type, another word would be um, an American. An American. What word, what qualities or characteristics come to mind? So when you think of an American. What what are the, what what qualities or characteristics uh, come to mind? What are the first things you think about? You don't have to think too long. It's just just the first thing, the first thing that comes to your mind. Any ideas? Okay, I can't see anything. Fair colored. Someone says fair colored. All right. Okay, I, I, I can see why. Um, anything else? So an American would, would, would essentially be a pow power or accent. That's very interesting. That's a very interesting view, power or accent. Now, let's put this out there. When I say an African, what's the first, what, what are the characteristics or uh, qualities that come to mind. Dark, okay. What else? So we have someone who says dark. Mediocrity, okay. I can definitely see, <laughs> I can definitely see how. All right, so what, what about if I said Africa, just the continent of Africa, what picture comes to mind? If you can describe a picture. So I see someone saying culture, tribe. This is very, very interesting. Very, very interesting. So these, these words that come to mind, quite frankly, every single time I give this talk about labels, these are the same words everybody uses for the Japanese samurai, the American, and the African. It's exactly the same. It's exactly the same, right? Why is it that when we hear a name, we have a word association with it that is built into our psyche? We cannot shake the fact that African means dark. We cannot shake the fact that uh, an American means fair colored, which means if you see somebody who is dark, but they say they're an American, there is a disparity there. The worst thing is if you see a dark samurai who says he's an American, that is impossible. It's impossible for your mind to, to comprehend of such a thing. These kind of groups or these limitations in our imagination is evidence that just as much as other people look at us with certain stereotypes, we also look at ourselves and others with similar stereotypes as well. It's very dangerous because if we are not aware of what stereotypes we see ourselves as, for example, someone said Africa, what comes to mind is culture, tribe, uh, mediocrity. If you see yourself as an African, and each time you say African, what comes to your mind is mediocre. 
how do you expect to stand out? How do you expect to challenge your own thinking? How do you expect to force your, your mind to see yourself as an extraordinary person? When the very identity you use to describe yourself as an African is mediocre to you, right? Or it's cultural and tribal. By the way, the word tribal, according to um, one of the famous African writers, Chinua Achebe, he says he does not like to use that word because it, it, um, it indicates a sense of uh, primitiveness, right? So he says he, he tries to stay away from the word tribal because if you, if you, if you, if you, if you pay very close attention, uh, the Western, Western countries have no tribes, right? And you hardly hear a, a white person say, you know, my, 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 my ancestral culture, my white culture. White people almost have no culture and they most certainly have no tribe. So if you see yourself as tribalistic, cultural, black, uh, dark, uh, mediocre, backwards, full of resources, but no production, things like that. It's going to be very difficult for you to work out of these things. So what you need to do, exactly, I think someone in the comment section said, is what has been projected over time and it's been subconsciously embedded in our minds. Very good. I like that. So this is exactly what labels are. Labels are things that people project on you or you project on yourself or others. That's exactly what a label is. And when you do it over and over and over again, you, it becomes baked into your mind so, so, so deeply baked that it becomes difficult for you to um, undermine these labels. That's why they are the most difficult or the most dangerous thing to your identity because a label will destroy you in a way that an identity cannot protect you. That's why it's, become, it's, it's very important for you to pay attention to the labels, the names that they call you and the names you call yourself. Like if you call yourself black, for example, that's just a color. That's not a name. I have a problem with people who call themselves black, like African-Americans, for example. Um, and it goes in line with some of the things that Ma Martin Luther King, well, Malcolm X in particular, who said, we are not African-Americans, we are Africans in America. There, there was a very clear distinctive difference that he made there. And in that way of thinking, you can see that he was someone who was fully individuated. He thought clearly and he thought for himself, very different from the group, what regular African-Americans would, would say about themselves, right? So someone like Malcolm X is a very good example of someone who was fully individuated and he didn't try to fit in, but he stood out. Uh, and you can see that from, um, from his speech and from his critical thought as well. So um, back to my point, uh, labels are very dangerous and the only way you can protect yourself from them is to understand what labels you call yourself or people call you, what labels you answer to by default, what titles you answer to because a person, I believe in, in, in today's world, particularly in Africa, maybe in Ghana, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sure about Nigeria, but in Ghana as well, when you begin to call a person chief or honorable, honorable so-and-so, honorable so-and-so, honorable minister, honorable this, that, whatever, they begin to behave more, uh, uh, more than human, more than normal. And by so doing, they believe that they own everything, right? They, they have the right to embezzle. They have the right to do whatever they want. No one can challenge them. So by calling them honorable, we are essentially giving them a title that they have not earned. And therefore they now believe that they are honorable, no matter what they do, they are honorable. So why should they have, or why should they try to practice honor when everybody already calls them honorable? It makes no sense. I got the job, now they call me honorable, but I can do whatever I want and they're still gonna call me honorable, right? So that is a very big problem in Africa that I believe we have. We, we, we give respect to people who have not deserved it. Whereas in the past, when we had, before the colonialists uh, came, titles were only given to people who actually deserve them. And that I believe is something that the colonialists had turned upside down in Africa, wherein they give titles to just anybody who was willing to do whatever the colonialists wanted. 
and they've left us with that system now where we elect people and we just call them certain names but these names or these titles have effects on on their mindset and we don't get to control them so that is one effect of the titles that people have and the epithets is the one that we've just demonstrated right now wherein when you call a particular name of a place tribe a person or an image uh, a, a, um, an image comes to mind and this is not something that you can control this is something that has been baked into your psyche right so understanding how these things play a role in your identity gives you power over these names titles and epithets in a way that you can begin to redefine the meaning in your mind that's the key word redefine you need to redefine what africa means to you and not uh, not accept anyone else's definition of what it means to you if it is important to you and you choose to use the word or you choose to use the name or the title or the label then you should be the one defining for yourself don't fit into the group of people who say africa means dark africa means cultural africa means tribal don't fit in stand out by defining for yourself what africa means to you and then you will be creating a foundation for other people to see your the way you think to see how different you are how extraordinary your imagination is and they will then say i like your definition of africa it's very different it's extraordinary it stands out i like it it makes me feel more powerful than the cultural tribal um, image that i had and i would want to uh, adopt your definition so you will by default be, and will become the apple in the tech industry whereas everybody is being microsoft hp and dell you would then be standing out so this redefinition is the most important thing when it comes to labels and identity in particular because if you are not defining what your identity means to you rather you are accepting definitions from other people it means you will, you belong to a group or they control your identity and like we said in the beginning i like to use a definition that said identity is the framework that uh, predetermines how you behave so if you don't control the identity or the label then you don't control your behavior someone else will that way you are easily manipulable and therefore you have things like identity politics take a very heavy role so i believe with this um i would have I, i have done a, a, a fair job of trying to explain to you how identity is important and how to stand out instead of to fit in and um the last thing i would want to leave you with is a framework a, something to take home what i want you to do is to make a list of all the different identities you subscribe to all the groups you are affiliated with and the beliefs you associate with just make a list of all these things and then if possible try to find their origin if i believe in a religion or something what is the origin of that religion if i believe in a group or i i believe i i'm i affiliate with a group i, I am associated with a group what is the origin of that just write them down with their origins and then try to categorize them into one of the three types of identities that we talked about either a fabricated identity contemporary or conditional identity and an original identity uh, and then once you've done that i want you to come and look at the um, the image we have on the screen here that says um, your nationality or uh, your your the personal views or values and your friends and so on and so forth these three groups are basically where people get their labels from you either get your labels from what country you're from what people say about your country uh what you say about your country what other countries or ethnicities or cultures you've lived in or you you've lived around the some of the things that you believe about yourself for example one very famous um one very popular experiment that i had we don't have, i believe we don't have um, women in this group besides rahanat the uh, founder of tlr but um one 
experiment that I like to have when I have these conversations is that I, I usually ask uh, a, a particular question around labels. And I, and I say, uh, when a woman, when, when we all know of these people who call themselves, you know, bad boys, right? Guys who call themselves bad guys or bad boys. The question is, what do you think a bad boy imagines he, he's uh, responsible to do or um, imagines is the next course of action when a situation arises and you know his friends call him you know bad guy you know like it's like it's like it's like it's up to you now this is like this is your time this is this is your chance is he going to do a good thing when he innately believes himself and he calls himself or he answers to the label of a bad boy or bad guy? Obviously not, he's not gonna do that. The example of this is, we all know of one person somewhere, somehow in life, who calls themselves um, princess, right? Now, in, in, in all of my experience in, in, in giving these talks, whenever I ask, and, and, I, and I think I did this in Malaysia as well with the Ministry of, Educa um, the Ministry of um, Tourism, I asked them, what is the behavior of a girl who calls herself princess? How, is she, how does she usually treat others? And the answer is usually the same. They all say uh, she's usually dismissive. She usually thinks of herself as better than other people. She usually treats people like they're less than, than, than she does. She believes she's entitled. They have an entitlement mindset, right? So how does this start? This begins from maybe a father or a parent calling their daughter princess, which is a very innocent thing. But over the years, that label becomes baked into that person. And then that person truly starts to believe that everybody else is their servant. It's a very dangerous thing. So these are some of the exercises that I would like you to do. What are your nicknames? What are your uh, labels, your epithets, your, uh, your um, titles that you have? If you're in the corporate world, are you a manager, director, leader, uh, employee? What, what labels do you use or do you answer to? And when you write them all down, then you can begin to get a sense of the groups you belong to or a picture of the identity that you have. And then all that is required is like I said, the most important key point, redefinition. When you begin to redefine what these things mean, if they are important to you, if they're not important to you, for example, like princess or bad boy, I would completely suggest you completely abolish them. You don't associate with them anymore because you cannot uh, control, you cannot control what they do to you. You cannot control their effects. They're, they're very powerful, right? So it's, it's best to just not be associated with them. Simplicity in this case is a, a virtue. So once you're able to outline all these uh, think, things, uh, it, 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 um, it becomes clearer for you how you are showing up in the world and why life looks to you a certain way more than uh, what it should be looking to you uh, um, um, ordinarily. I think I see someone making a post here. He says, I think bad guy is a metaphorical, is, is metaphorical depending on the context in which it is said. Sometimes bad guy can be both positive and negative. In fact, that's true. Bad guy can be both positive and negative, but the word itself says bad guy. So I think uh, what actually happens in reality is that you do not create the image of a bad guy. If, I, if, if we played the same game and I said, what is, what, when I say bad guy, what image comes to your mind? I don't think anybody here would say somebody who goes to church every Sunday, you know, somebody who takes care of their family, somebody who's a father, who like, like you know, he, like he provides for his family. That's not the image of a bad guy, right? The image of a bad guy is someone who wears leather pants, who wears leather jackets, rides, rides on a bike, who has, he has multiple girlfriends, many phones, he probably steals, beats people up, right? That's the image of a bad guy. So we don't control that image, right? So the effect of it is more powerful than our personal view. An example would be, we all know the Michael Jackson song, I'm bad. 
if Michael Jackson sang that song in a white garment, going to church and you know praising God, and it's not it, it, it does not it does not fit in properly. There's a problem with that. So for him to wear you know the black and black clothes, people with knives and all of that stuff, singing and bad, it fits the picture. Why does it fit the picture? That's the question. It fits the picture because that is our idea of what is bad, what is wrong, right? So that idea that it fits the picture is stronger than the idea that he could be in church praising God, but saying, I am bad. But that's also true. Yes, I am bad. Therefore, I'm in church praying. But that's really not reconcilable. It's, it's, it, it's a little bit of a stretch. So I hope you understand that. So that's, that's what we're talking about here. The one is more powerful than the other. And you have to pay attention to the one that is more powerful because that is the one that has a stronger, more lasting effect. So um, with this, I, I think we have come to the, come to the, um, come to the end and, and I hope this helps to clarify. But I think I'll, I'll uh, like to give the mic back to uh, Rehanet right now to, um, uh, uh, for any closing uh, remarks. And then maybe I'll open it up for a bit of a, one or two questions, if possible. And then before we can wrap up, uh, God willing. So Rahanet, back to you. Yeah, thanks a lot, Mr. Dean. That was, that was quite, 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 quite educative and informative. I think that disclaimer could just straight out the window because this was quite, <laughs> quite a nice talk. So um, for the participants, if you have any questions, kindly type your questions on the chat and then Dean will have some answers for you. But if you assume you're good and we could just um, wrap it up and call it a day. So we'll just wait to see if one or two questions pop up for the chat. But before those questions come up, I was thinking maybe if you could just um, clarify a little bit for, for, for viewers in terms of your take home. So after they classify um, their titles, their names and everything, so what are they supposed to do? Throw out what they don't want and then keep what they want or more or less like build what they want towards what they want to be? Uh, huh? How, what's the what's the final um, stuff they have to do after classifying everything and categorizing? I can see that you put something about in the middle saying you. So are they supposed to close everything up to get to themselves or they kind of, how, how does that work? Just give us a little bit of a... Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. So basically how this works is um, the you in the middle there. Well, basically what you are trying to do with this exercise is uh, you are trying to reconcile how you show up to the world now with all your, you know, your, your, your labels, your nicknames, your titles, your epithets, your identities that you usually define yourself as. And then once you get a clear picture of what those are, you, you practice a redefinition. You redefine what these things mean. You redefine them for yourself, not for other people, not for the future generation. You redefine them in a way that gives meaning to you, in a way that ha has the most meaning to you. But like I said, you only redefine the things that are important to you. For example, if you are a manager, what does that mean? If you are a director, what does that mean? If you are an employee of a certain company, what does that mean? If you are a leader, what does it mean? Don't accept the definitions of other people. Define for yourself what that means to you, if it is important. However, if you call yourself a bad guy and all these things, these don't necessarily have a, a generally positive image it's better to call yourself a dangerous man than to call yourself a bad guy because a bad guy seems to have like a derogatory social image. The bad guy is almost somewhere at the bottom of the social order. So you will find yourself fitting into that bottom layer of society if you define yourself as a bad guy. But if you call yourself a dangerous person in modern in, in these modern times, a dangerous person is a person who thinks very differently, who thinks for themselves, who is, a, who is different from the crowd. A very highly educated uh, um, individual who has resources uh, and is able to uh, deploy their resources at their free will. 
this is a very dangerous person in today's world. A very good example of a dangerous person in today's world is Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk, these men have, have demonstrated that they are very, very, very dangerous, meaning that they have the power and the means to do whatever motive they wish or, or, or whatever um, they will. And therefore, they can actually topple governments. They can, they can, they can uh, uh, build or destroy societies. So that's a dangerous person. Uh, so it's not necessarily a, a good image for someone like that to see himself as a bad guy, because what that does mentally is that it puts him at the bottom of society. Bad guys are usually the guys who go to jail and who are running away from the police, whereas a dangerous man is someone who, you know, he has his own bodyguards and, 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 and essentially, so, so you get the image. So, that, that, so that's what I'm asking you to do. Um, create the image that exists for you right now and be completely honest about it all the nicknames that you have, the things you like, your interest and so on, and then redefine the ones that are important to you. And then begin to only operate with the redefined um, things that are important to you and completely abolish the ones that are predefined. Does this uh, clarify for you to take the take, uh, take home assignment, uh, Rehanit? Yeah, yeah, it does. Thanks a lot. I think that clarifies for me and all participants. So um, I think um, we saw some questions, but they're not necessarily something you have to answer. I think that has already been answered. Asking about the video, can you get access to the video and all that? Yeah, so that will all be sent to the participants um, that registered. So um, at this juncture, I want to just say thank you very much, Dean. It was a very wonderful session and we're looking forward to much more, more sessions. We just want to inform participants that you can actually book um, consultation sessions with Dean on our website, www.tlrconsult.com, and then you can have one-on-one -on -one consultation sessions with him on issues of um, personality and um, identity. It's more about a one-on-one -on -one thing because everybody's different. So you have to kind of speak to him one-on-one -on -one to understand how maybe he gets to know who you are and then maybe he guides you to finding yourself uh, not to say you're lost or something or kidnapped but you know <laughs> you just kind of have to find ourselves one way in the mind so so i think it's uh it's, it's been a good session and i think at this point we could actually wrap up if we don't have any other questions i'm seeing a chat let's see if we have a um, all right cool it's just yeah um, so I, I i i would like to open it to questions or any particular insights in and um by the participants because insights are also very 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 much welcome it's not i would like it not to be a one-way conversation if possible all right, cool. And then I think we could do something that we don't normally do. So since it's kind of a unique training, maybe let's um, give the participants opportunity to actually speak out and see if they want to say something more or less like um, able to communicate from how they see the whole thing. So um, maybe if the participants will just unmute and then let's just let's hear you guys out. What do you think? What do you think about the whole training, the topic and everything? Mr. Bright, Mr. Peter, we're we'll waiting to hear from you. Just kindly unmute and then we can hear you. Hi, good afternoon. Yeah, good afternoon. Yeah, Mr. Peter, we can hear you loud and clear. Please go good ahead. Well, good, well, good Hi, evening here. Yeah. It's good evening. <laughs> good afternoon, yeah. Uh -huh. Thank you for the session. I I really, it's been very revealing. <laughs> it's very re re revealing. Now I understand the impact and the power that identity carries and as much as possible the the subconscious uh what i've what i've been learned subconsciously what i've been imbibed subconsciously i then need to consciously start purging them out and start with defining what i want to see what i want to be identified with even as a person as a brand as um an entity you understand so thank you very much i really appreciate this this topic and i i appreciate the examples you you used you you used to buttress the point you made, and um, I before the host sorry the TLC before she made mention of you, I, I wanted to ask about that because I was then wondering, okay, you said bad guy and um, the general view, and then what you should pick for yourself. But that final explanation, that explanation you gave last, really made justice, really gave justice to to, to the point, and I get it clearly now. Thank you very much, Mr. Dean. You're welcome. You're welcome. I appreciate you attending and um, hope to see you soon. 
Thanks very much, Mr. Peter. Mr. Bright, if you could just kindly unmute and we can hear you. We hope you're not a shy person. No, please, not at all. Yeah, that's good. That's the Ghanaian voice. So please say something. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, yeah, I mean, the session has been good. I mean, it, for me, like this, I, I'll say it has been very reflective because um, this is not something that like, I've um, made a conscious effort to be thinking about, but um, in this space where it has been spelled out and then explained um, and, I mean, decongested like this, I think it's, it's a session that like, it should, people should really find time and then um, listen to and then be able to pick out certain um, points from it. I think one of the quotes that um, he said that I really liked was um, about being the sovereign identity. And I think a person who um, having full control of his or you know, identity. And I think from the points that I've written down myself, I think um, I'll, 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 I'll follow through with the take home assignment and then I'll do, I'll, I'll redefine myself. So yeah, I say, I'll say, um, it was a very great session and thanks for hosting the space. Yeah, You're welcome. I, you. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. One good, one, one good um, point. I like what you said about, uh, about people having to come to, um, to find the time to do this because the one thing you can, the one sign that you can tell when, when a person has a sovereign identity, for example, when a th person thinks individually or a person has uh, what we call fully individuated you are you are a fully individuated person it means you are completely separate from groups you can think differently without any influence externally is that when people in this personal development field are saying things like i'm trying to find myself i'm trying to find who i am I'm trying to understand myself better that instinctively tells you that this person is struggling with a group identity or a non-sovereign identity, because in reality, you cannot find yourself. You cannot find what is not missing. You are not miss You're not a missing person, like uh, Rehan had said. Uh, you are not. You are not lost. You are not missing. So finding yourself, that word, that phrase that people use a lot, actually shows the level of their individuation. They have not fully individuated to think. It myself is not something I find. Myself is something that I determine, I commit to a self, and then I develop that self. I choose to be something and I stick to that thing. And I define for myself who I am. Like we said in the beginning, identities are things we use to tell others who we are. You know, it's not something we go and find. When a person says, I need to find myself, essentially what they're saying is like, I'm looking for a group to fit into, or I'm looking for an identity to just accept, to adopt, but they don't want to create one of their own, right? So these are some of the terminologies that people use that helps you understand their level of individuation. People who have gone through a sense of personal development will not use uh, uh, phrases like finding myself. They would say uh, things more like becoming my best self or defining myself or, or making myself or being myself or being authentic. You will hear that a lot, particularly if you are around these clubhouse spaces or online, you would hear people say things like, you know, being authentic, being authentically me. I mean, these days on social media, people use it just randomly, loosely, but essentially that is a higher level of thinking than people who say, you know, they're finding themselves because that means like, you know, I have no control to, to, to make, myself, whoever I want to do, I just have to find what is there and take that. I mean, someone else is meant to create it and that's not me. So um, yes, sovereign identities, are the future of uh, leaders right now and anybody right now who has a, a sovereign mentality, who is able to think for themselves will ultimately be the leader in any particular situation they find themselves, in any room they are, in any um, occupation they hold, or any career they embark on, they, they will always be much better than um, people who wait for instructions or you know, uh, 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 follow the crowd or follow the group. So yeah, that's, that's a very insightful um, contribution. Thank you very much for your contribution, uh, Mr. Peter. So back to you, Rahanet. Yeah, 
Thanks a lot. That was that was quite great. Yeah, and I, I like the thing you said about finding yourself. That terminology is used a lot. But um, I I really don't know. You know, being in Africa and being out of Africa, you know, it's kind of like a two two kind of different lives. You so, so most times, what we come to understanding is people in Africa when they use the word "I'm trying to find themselves," it's just kind of like a cry for help. It's like they know something is wrong, something is missing, but they just can't explain it. So they're like. I need to find myself because I know where I am is not the right place, but I really don't know where else to be. So um, just like what Mr. Peter said, like when you hear talks like this, or what Mr. Bright said, you, when you listen to talks like this, it makes you understand that, okay, yeah, that thing you're saying, find yourself. It's just like your inner self telling you that something is wrong and where you always know where you need to be, but you don't have so much of information to know where else you can be or what else you can do because trainings like this, mastering identity, trainings like this on, my self-awareness, emotional intelligence. These are things that we're not used to in Africa. These are things that um, we see as being, you know, when you're trying to speak about um, issues you're having and say, no, you're, you're not tough, you're uh, Africans, black, black people don't get depressed, you know, all these kind of um, conditions that we've grown up with, we feel like uh, we're strong, we can just do things anyhow and all that. So I think um, we have to find a way to, to, to reach out to more Africans to make them understand that these are things they need to like sit down, listen to, and try to understand, you know, and then just more or less like break all those titles that they grew up um, learning and just some more like recreate new titles for themselves. And um, I'm thinking maybe we really need to catch them young. Maybe we need to go more into universities and students before they get to accept so much of these labels. And then maybe when they are young, it's easier for them to more or less like throw out those labels and not find new ones for themselves. What do you think? Yes, I, I was speaking to, um, that, that's a very insightful addition. Uh, there are two things here. When, when, when people say or use the phrase finding themselves, um, they already know something is wrong. But what makes them know that something is wrong is their innate self. It's already there telling them that this image is not correct. But what they're looking for is a safe space to practice what they have internally, which is what they never find because there is in life there is no safe space. You have to be sovereign. And being sovereign means you create your own boundary. You create your own space and say, this is who I am. These are my terms. These are my principles. These are my values. And if you don't belong and you don't want to um, respect them, then feel free to leave. But I will not change for you and I will not force you to change for me. I am sovereign, like a government is sovereign, right? You have a boundary around your country. These are, these are our lands. These are our laws. As, as long as you're within our country, you have to obey. So what people try to find is that that safe space in, in, order, in order to practice what they innately know to be true. It's a sign of essentially uh, weakness. Um, that's basically what it is. And uh, you're actually right about that. That, you know, um, it's in, in Africa is used as a sense of, you know, looking for um, a, a, a pre-existing definition or something like that. But in, 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 in the case of educating the new generation, um, I, I, was, I, was in a, I was in a discussion recently, I, I think it was on the NSARS discussion um, with uh, some of the Nigerian celebrities and uh, uh, the young political group. And they were talking about nation building. I believe it was with... Uh, you know, the Feladurotoes and the Showare and a few others. And they were saying that, you know, their idea of nation building was, you know, to uh, redefine the country. And, and I asked specifically, what specific actions will you take in order to redefine or to, to build the nation that you want to see? And quite frankly, to put it quite simply, I wasn't quite satisfied with what they're saying because they didn't really understand what they were trying to do. They were on the right course, but the actions that they were taking were more of a followers type of actions, not a leader's type of action. Whereas in my understanding, it would be like just what you said, starting with the young generation with uh, um, education on topics like these, because uh, looking to America or looking to the West to fix Africa is not going to work. 
The West have their identity. They believe they are better than everybody else. That is who they are. So for us to simply borrow their identity and use it in Africa, it's not going to work. We will feel inferior every single day if we feel like we are Americans or we are better than everybody else. We don't have to compete with them. What we have to do is to redefine for ourselves what Africa is to ourselves. And then we need to inform them of the new Africa that we have built. And, but that will only become more possible with education. And it, it, it only becomes uh, more entrenched or more solid when we educate the younger generation to think differently from our generation. Because I believe with, with us, in addition to the education, there has to be a lot of healing of the trauma. And that takes a lot of time. But with the young generation, there is no trauma. So we can just simply educate them and let them know that this is the way things are. You define for yourself your principles and your values, and you don't let someone else predefine them for you. This will exponentially increase our rates of growth and our success in the future, God willing, uh, rather than expecting some sovereign leader to come and change everything in the country. This is something that every individual in Africa can do for themselves that will exponentially improve Africa. Uh, and I think um, we actually have to start from, like I have started in Malaysia here with um, the primary school, uh, the secondary school curriculum. I, I, I just recently completed my uh, university uh, tour and I hope to be doing one in Africa quite recently as well. Um, um, uh, uh, I mean, I'm, some, I'm sometime in the near future speaking to uh, students in colleges and universities about this idea because it is usually within that age that they try to find their place in the world. And what they need to understand is that finding your place is fitting into a group and that's, that's the wrong thing to do. What you need to be doing is to define who you are and going out into the world with the courage uh, to carve your space. Because uh, I'll give you a good example. The new world order is something that everybody has been talking about, but everybody has been talking about it as we don't want it, we don't like it, we don't like the idea, it's an evil, it's a Freemasonry type, um, Illuminati type idea. Instead of people thinking about, if the new world order comes, I need to let, I need to define my position, my place in this new world order. Otherwise, if I don't do that, somebody else will define my place for me. Right. So this is the this these are these are the ideologies that we need to be putting in the uh, um, in the mind of the younger people, the uh, um, younger generation, rather than telling them avoid the um, new world order. It's not a good thing. It's it's gonna come. It's gonna happen. Maybe it's already here, but we need to be the ones defining for ourselves uh, what our place is, and not letting anyone else tell us uh, where we should be. In, uh, um, I mean, this new world, and it and, it, and, it, and I think it's something that we can all do. It, as individuals and as individual countries as well. So um, I, 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 I hope this um, explanation helps. But back to you, Rehane. And uh, oh my also God. any closing, so closing remarks? Yeah, we said so much today. And I think um, at this juncture, we could just close this meeting and then ah, thank everyone for joining. And then we wish you a very, very good weekend ahead. Thanks, Dean. Bye. Thank you. Have a good day. Good night. All right, bye-bye, everyone. Yeah.